I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness. If it wasn't for the cross, you have won me with your kindness. Chased me down when I was lost. Where would I be if it wasn't for the cross? Hallelujah, thank you Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not, with your blood you bought my freedom, hallelujah, for the cross. My shame was met with mercy. Now your mercy will be my song and all the glory, all the power of the cross. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a now I'm not With your blood you Bought my freedom Hallelujah For the cross Hallelujah Thank you Jesus I was a prisoner Now I'm not with your blood you bought my freedom hallelujah for the cross by your stripes i'm healed by your death i live have a sin is overcome it is finished it is done by your stripes i'm healed by your death I live The power of sin is overcome It is finished, it is done By your stripes I'm healed By your death I live The power of sin is overcome It is finished, it is done By your stripes I'm healed By your death I live the power of sin is overcome, it is finished, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not. With your blood you bought my freedom, hallelujah, for the cross. Hallelujah, thank you Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not, with your blood you bought my freedom, hallelujah, for the cross. Good afternoon, CCCNJ. I'm going to open us up with pastoral prayer. If you all bow your heads with me. God, we're just thankful that even while we're in the comforts of our home, Lord, we can still be present here to worship together. 
to hear from your words. And so, Lord, may you uh, fill Pastor Paul with your wisdom, with your uh, just guidance. And may we have our hearts be ready to hear from him and hear from you. Lord, as we recognize that you've chosen us to be your people, to walk with you, Lord, uh, may we continue to be comforted and guided by your peace, your love, your patience, and your grace. And all this we lift up into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. that you can hear from an authority that you respect. Like when you were a kid at a pickup game in the playground. The two best players usually are the captains, and then one of them picks you first, or at least before your other friends are chosen. He tells you, you're chosen, you're on my team. Oh, when you open up that acceptance letter from the college of your dream. Of course, nowadays you go to the computer screen to your college's website and you click to see whether you see, congratulations, you're accepted or not, right? Or when your boss comes to you with a big smile on his face, extends his hand to you and says, congratulations, you are promoted. That feeling of excitement and exuberance when you get chosen into the team or the school or the company of your choice, I want you all to feel just as elated that God says to you today, you are chosen on my team. So in today's passage, Peter reminds his audience of exile believers, that they are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's special possession. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, 
offering spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So in this passage, Peter takes the overall metaphor of a temple and here this is a model of what the Jerusalem the temple in Jerusalem which King Solomon built looks like and he takes three other metaphors that revolve around this temple right he takes a metaphor of stones that are used to build the walls of the temple where he calls them living stones he takes the metaphor of a priest who are the people who serve in a temple and then he uses the metaphor of a sacrifice, which is what is being offered in a temple. Now, why do you think Peter used these three metaphors in this epistle to the Jewish believers who were exiled in the area of Asia Minor? It's because Peter was writing to encourage the Jewish believers who had to flee their homeland to escape persecution, remember? So brothers and sisters, if you had immigrated to the United States from Taiwan or Malaysia or Hong Kong or China or even from Germany, you know how it felt the first year you were in a strange land away from home, right? Because you had to learn a new language, you had to absorb and understand a new culture, you missed the good food you ate back home, you missed the traditions that you followed in your home country, right? In the same way, these Jewish believers, you know, they really had to miss the tradition and the rituals they have followed for their religious practices Remember, they grew up in Israel being taught the importance of offering sacrifices for the atonement of their sins at the temple in Jerusalem on special feasts such as Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, uh, the Passover, right? But now that they believed in Jesus Christ and they're now in exile in Asia Minor, they knew that they didn't have to offer or bring anyone animal grain sacrifices um, to atone for the sins um, because that's what Jesus Christ did for them. But human nature is, if every Sabbath day they were used to going to the synagogue, synagogue means a place of worship of the Jewish people away from the main temple in Jerusalem, you know, they see their other fellow Jewish people exiles, but they didn't convert to fall after Jesus Christ, they may still go to synagogue, but they missed um, just that, that, that ritual, that tradition they used to do every week, right? I hope you can identify with that because all of us for the last six months, we ha may have missed going to CCCNJ to the actual church building for Sunday worship, right? Because of the coronavirus pandemic, the church building is still closed. So you can identify a little bit about what they had missed. 
So Peter very cleverly uses the three metaphors that these Jewish exiles, they understand, and this is what they were kind of lamenting about. And so he uses the three metaphors to make them understand, hey, don't feel so bad at all. Actually, what we have now in Jesus Christ is much better than the religious practices we used to have. Because he says, you know that temple that you guys all worshiped at? Well, we are all actual living stones in a living temple right now. So let me read to you again. Verse 4, Peter says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God, he's talking about Jesus Christ, and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal, holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, brothers and sisters, Peter makes this very important theological distinction here. I'll put it up for you. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. Okay? In the New Testament, God now has a people for his temple. So let me explain to you this doctrinal shift, right? It's very important, right? Now, of course, God's the one who created human beings. So when he created human beings, uh, for man, humans, having a loving relationship with his creator was the most important thing. And you had a relationship with God by um, enjoying his presence. So when Adam and Eve was first put into Garden Eve, and you know, in Genesis, they used to walk together uh, in the cool of the night, Adam and Eve and God, right? They had this physical presence of God. But as you know, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God by eating the forbidden fruit, uh, that relationship was cut off or severed because of their sin. And be, from that point on, where God said, Anytime man uh, sins or disobeys me, there must be the shedding of blood uh, to atone for the sins. And that's why when um, Adam and Eve realized they were naked, uh, God actually killed some animals to require the shedding of blood and use the skin of those animals to pro uh, provide his clothing to Adam and Eve. Okay, and then let's go to when... We're talking about the chosen people of God, right? The Jewish people, right? When God used Moses to bring the Israelites who were in captivity as slaves in Egypt out of Egypt, right? Um, that's when God not only gave them the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, God instructed Moses and the Levi priests how to create this um, tent of the Holy of Holies because God realized that human beings, they need to see God. They need to feel his presence. So uh, the best they can do is God said, okay, create this holy of holies. And in the most holy side, the innermost tent, um, that's where you put the Ark of the Covenant. That's where this Ark of the Covenant contained most, uh, Moses' rod or staff, um, pieces, representations of the manna, and the... Ten Commandments, right? Okay, and then uh, give it a couple more uh, generations later, King Solomon actually got to build the beautiful temple, the model which I showed earlier in Jerusalem, because God knew that his people, his chosen people, the Jewish people, the Israelites, they need to see the presence of God. So it was his temple in Jerusalem, and every important feast, all the Jewish people will need to come there with their sacrifices to offer to God at the temple uh, via the high priest to atone for the sins. Okay, so I made my point right. In the Old Testament, God had a temple, a physical temple for his people. But in the New Testament, thank God, Jesus Christ came lived a perfect life, 
He died for our sins. He became the ultimate sacrifice. So uh, all who follow him, who believe in Jesus, we no longer have to bring a, a, an actual sacrifice of an animal and, and have its uh, blood shed because Jesus did for us. And we know that because symbolically, the scripture says when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the curtain, the drapery that uh, shielded the Holy of Holies from the rest of the people where only the uh, highest priest can go in, that was torn in half. So that was no longer necessary. So now it's a beautiful picture now, doctrinally, theologically. Now God says, I change things around now. In the New Testament, my people, people who believe in Jesus Christ, you need to be God's temple or you need to be the representation of God's presence in this world, right? And that's why in the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. So this is a beautiful imagery that really shows you the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now let's go on. Verse 7, now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. So what Peter is saying here is basically the relationship between human beings and Jesus Christ. Here he's basically saying, for believers of Jesus Christ, Christ becomes our cornerstone. And many of you know, in um, buildings, uh, the architects always lays what's called the first stone, the cornerstone, and uh, upon which all the other stones are laid out and built, right? It's the foundation. So Peter's saying, um, for all believers who believe in Jesus Christ, Christ is a cornerstone, our foundation, on which we built the living temple of God. But for people who reject Jesus as their Christ or as a Savior, then it's interesting. Jesus Christ becomes a stumbling stone. You know, the type of stone that you trip and fall over because they refuse to believe in Jesus Christ. Now let's go on. The second metaphor of us being priests in God's temple. Verse 9 says, it's a good verse to memorize, uh, my friends. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So. The second metaphor of a priest, why does Peter use that? Not only because the Jewish people all knew the function of a priest, but let me explain this to you. In Latin, the word priest is pontifex. And if you know Latin, ponti means bridge, fex means to build. So the function of a priest is someone who builds a bridge between God and man. Now, of course, Jesus Christ was the ultimate Pontifex, right? Because of his crucifixion and death and resurrection, he bridged the gap between man and God. The gap was created when Adam and Eve sinned. Great. But now it's important for all of us to know that this whole passage of Peter is, it's not just Jesus Christ who was a cornerstone. Um, remember, God chose all of us Christians to be his priesthood. So we need to know what it does it mean to be a priest, right? I just read recently, I was reading about the Reformation, and Martin Luther said, not all of us are called to be pastors, but all of us are called to be priests. He was using priests in the um, term, of what believers' function should be. So we need to ask ourselves, what's the main function of a priest? So I say, a priest offers 
sacrifices to God. So let's look at this more closely, right? This is my third section, sacrifices in God's temple. In Psalm 51, verse 17, King David says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, would not despise. So the first sacrifice we learn in this new era where God is calling us to be a living temple is that we need to bring to God the sacrifice of penance, which means we need to approach God first by confessing of our sins and repenting of a wrongdoing. That's the first sacrifice we need to bring in God's temple. Then in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, we learn, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So, another sacrifice that we, in a role as priests, can bring to God is a sacrifice of priests. That's why it's so important for us that every Sunday meet together, and until we can meet physically in person, and meet through this online uh, Sunday service so that we can jointly offer our sacrifices of praise and worship to God. Sacrifice of praise. Then let me uh, share with you another major sacrifice we as priests can bring to God in this new living temple. And, um, I give you an example of when the Macedonian church sent, collected an offering, even though they're all poor people, they collected an offering and sent it to Paul. So in Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, we learn from Paul, he says, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. Isn't that beautiful? We all know that the first crime, the first murder committed in the Bible or in this world is when Cain murdered his brother Abel because he saw that Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God and not his, right? So that imagery of whatever you sacrifice, what? The outcome we want is for God to say, smells so good. This is so fragrant. This is an acceptable sacrifice to God, right? So we're talking about the sacrifice of possessions. Now, of course, one of the easiest currency to sacrifice is our money because money is currency it can be easily convertible into cash so that the church um, can distribute your offering of cash money to the maintenance of the building or for love give or for different ministries. So that's the best, one of the easiest uh, uh, examples of a possession. But as you know, we have other possessions, right? So we can get the sacrifice of our time, right? when we use our own time to serve in church or in other ministries to help other people, or sometimes we have in a possession, we may have an extra spare car that if we find somebody, uh, a new student who just came into town and they need a car, we can perhaps let them use our car. Or um, if we have extra food in the pantry, or we have extra clothing to the needy people, those are different ways that we can share or give of our possessions to people, right? So these are, of course, there's so many other sacrifices you can bring um, to God, but these are the three uh, major sacrifices that you can bring to God in your role as a priest. And uh, the importance of this, is is uh, demonstrated because Peter ends this section of his letter, chapter 2, in verse 11, saying, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles 
to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. If you remember, I began today's sermon with these three beautiful words, you are chosen. And that's, if you don't remember anything, just remember that you're chosen by God to be on his team as a royal priesthood, right? And then I thought to myself, wow, if these three words are what evoke such a good feeling in me or in us, what's the opposite of that? And of course, the first thing I thought about is you're fired or you're unwanted or maybe you've got problems, right? And of course, um, if we all look back at the last six months. It's been a very difficult six months for all of us because of the uh, pandemic's quarantine, right? Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but if you're living together with your spouse or if you're with your parents or children and everybody's doing work, uh, personal stuff, meals, uh, homework, everything all together in one enclosed space, you know, we're bound to get onto each other's nerves, right? Well, not only that, there are those of you who graduate from college and those of you who may have gotten laid off, so you're in the process of looking for a new job, but because of the pandemic and the high, high unemployment, it's been very hard to get interviews and to get hired, right? Um, and also, how about just, just like the... Um, these Jewish believers that Peter was written are routines, right? You know, human beings are creatures of habit. So you students, I'm sure you miss getting up in the morning and going to school to actually uh, meet your friends in person and not via Zoom. Or I'm sure for all of you who had a, a job in the city or just locally, it was nice to get up and dress in a suit or dress nicely and going to work and just had that routine of separation of um, home life and work life, right? Or many of you, you know, I'm sure you miss going out to your favorite restaurant with your friends and buddies, right? These routines were all upended because of this coronavirus pandemic. And if you turn on the cable news at night or you watch the news on your, uh, uh, smartphone. Uh, every day we learn about the number of coronavirus infections and death, and we're seeing so many of these political ads, uh, ads that seem so divisive. And and it, it, if you're human, these things are bound to get you down. So, friends, I just wanted to encourage you, just like Peter did. You know, we don't have to have these things get us down because we are a special possession of God. We're chosen by God, right? So we have hope. And I like this image that I found. Um, and here's an image of Jesus Christ. And it's actually made up of like 30 times uh, 40, uh, 1,200 little pixels or, or little photos of different people. But they place it in such a way that together they form a colorful image of Jesus' face, right? So the exhortation that Peter gave us is come and be his living stones who are continually being assembled into a sanctuary for God. So this is a great lesson for all of us that CCC and J regeneration, it's not based on a physical building that we go to. We are his temple. And so when each of us, as a stone, you know, usually stones are cold and dead, but if we're living, we're warm, we're alive, if these stones are placed next to each other, we're working with each other, each of us are using our spiritual gifts to encourage the body, right? And then together we make up a beautiful mosaic, an actual living temple of God here in Persephone to reflect God's glory and to do his mission's work until he comes back again. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us so that 
no longer do we need a temple to go to, like in the Old Testament times, to feel your presence. Instead, it's an amazing imagery where you call on us, believers of Jesus Christ, to become like living stones. And by working together, fellowshiping together, by worshiping together, we, in essence, become the living temple of God so that the outside world and non-believers, when they see us, the people of God becomes the temple of God to be the manifest presence of God in this world. What an incredible honor and privilege to be and serve as temples of the living God. And so, Lord Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, I ask that you taught us today that you call us a royal priesthood. And so help us to remember our role and function of a priest for you, which in the uh, broader sense is to serve as a bridge between our non-Christian family members or friends and you, God. And we can also help to fulfill our daily, weekly, monthly role as contemporary priests in your temple by always approaching you with a sacrifice of penance, of repentance, of confession of sins, and to bring the sacrifice of praise to you. And then you remind us that that's not enough. There must be a sacrifice, a possession, as we learn through our sermon series of King David, every time David committed a sin, whether the sin of adultery with Bathsheba or the sin of pride of counting his own men in a census, when he repented and confessed his sin, you forgave him, but you still required a punishment, uh, an offering something that cost him something. And David willingly did that. So Lord, help us to remember that there must be a sacrifice we bring to you weekly basis of our possessions, whether that would be our financial donations to your church, or it's the time we spend to serve you and to love our neighbors, or any of our physical possessions that you've given us that perhaps we can share with others, Lord. Lord, grant that you take all the gifts that we have, and as we've learned from Pastor Joseph, we're just stewards. Everything we own is not really ours. We're just stewards of what you gave us to do. So help us to be wise stewards and wise priests. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, Weak, made strong in a Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I 
rest on His unchanging grace And every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil Christ alone, cornerstone Weak, made strong in the Savior's love Through the storm And now is the time for announcements. And so we have a few, so bear with me and I'm just gonna go through them as quickly as we can. The first is just of course, letting us know the next upcoming sermons. Next week, uh, I'll be preaching on our third sermon on the series of stewardship. And then the week after that on November 1st, Pastor Paul is going to preach about this idea of submission to government, uh, continuing on his uh, first Peter series. Next, we just wanna invite you guys, all of you who are young adults to Yam Fellowship. We meet every Tuesday at 8 p.m. I pass up all on us, have a nice photo here just to show you all the fun that we're having. So if you're free or if, you know, especially during this quarantine time, you wanna spend some more time in community, please join us on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. One thing we also wanna invite you to is Wednesday night prayer. So you probably know with the coronavirus and everything happening, the church is constantly praying through and planning on how we can reopen. So join us this Wednesday uh, at 8 p.m. The link is right there, tinyurl.com slash regenprayer. Join us so that we can pray together as a church uh, as, and as the leaders plan all this out, they're gonna need a lot of prayers. So come together and pray with us. 
Now the next announcement is that there's a new Sunday school starting and Tim Cha is going to be leading us through it. It's five lessons on how Paul proclaims Jesus as Lord. And so the link is still tinyurl.com slash regen at Sunday school, which is SS. So please join us on Sundays at 10 a.m. right before service and we'll be able to dive deeper into the text together. The next announcement is for the memorial service of Fred Longnecker. That's happening on Saturday, October 24th at 10 a.m. It's also going to be live streamed on CCNJ's YouTube channel. So we invite you to come and join us and his family as we mourn, but as we also recognize that he's now with the Lord. The last announcement, and this is very important, it is that the General Assembly is coming around. And so we need to make sure that you are registered, that you are uh, making sure that you know what you need to do in order to um, vote. So make sure that you go on member.cccnj.org, log in and so that when, and click on the GA so that when the time comes, you'll be ready to go. That's all the announcements we have for today. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, if you would receive the benediction, uh, like usual, as you, per usual, I would invite you guys to just hold your hands out in an open format. The reason we do this is because, not just because we're some weird cult or anything like that, but because we want to be receiving from God, receiving his words and his blessings. So please hold your hand out op wide open as I uh, pray over us. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Oh.